Praise the Lord. Come on, if you all stand, we're going to go quickly to the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 19. We're going to read a lengthy portion of scripture, but I think it's necessary. Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to begin in verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And for a short time today, I want to speak to you from this subject. Give God total control over your tomorrow. Pastor, if you will pray for us. Let us pray. Dear God, we're thankful, Lord, for your loving kindness. And we're thankful for your tender mercies, oh God. And when we hear your word, we are so, we're so insufficient we fall short and lord we stand so much in need sometimes we can't even lift up our eyes to heaven because of how how far we fall short of your word i pray you to help us to trust you dear god help us somewhere along the line that faith will grow in us Every one of us, Lord, stand in need, stand in need of your grace. Increase our faith, O oh God. Lord, there's so many times we're anxious about tomorrow. But God, you have challenged us tonight that you clothe even the grass. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will lay your hand upon us one more time and lift us, Lord. And you would lift us, O oh God, that we can please you in all of our life. Lay your hand upon Brother Scott tonight, and I pray, God, you give him a word from the Lord. 
and that we will be strengthened with might in the inner man. Lord Jesus, help us, I pray, and strengthen us, I pray, and use us, O oh God. Stretch forth your hand through this church with signs and wonders and miracles. As you lift us, as you work on us, as you fashion us, as you take out all of the various impurities in our lives, Lord, we are we're desirous to be what you really want us to be. Help us, I pray. Strengthen us, I pray. Encourage us, I pray. Amen. Fortify us, I pray. And build us, I pray, that we will be what you want us to be. Hear from heaven. Perform and do it as we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. And all the people say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you for standing so long. Our text is a passage of scripture that is taken from what is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Matthew 5 through 7. And the central theme of the sermon is summarized in Matthew 5 and 48. It says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The word perfect here doesn't necessarily mean sinless or moral perfection, but it indicates a completeness that we need to possess, a wholeness, a maturity, or being all that God has called us to be. So whatever God desires for us to be, or whatever he's called us to do, we must make it our goal to reach that. And we must pursue it daily. The goal he has set for us has to be in our sights always. So the Sermon on the Mount gives us instruction on what God expects us, of us. It gives us the goals that we need to attain to. He starts off with what we call the Beatitudes, where he's talking about the rewards we will receive when we have the right attitude of the kingdom. He tells us that we're salt and light. And what he's telling us is our separation from the world is actually going to benefit the world. Just as salt is going to give flavor to whatever you put it in. Just as light is going to come in and remove the darkness. He talks about true righteousness in verse 20. He tells us that we must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees who were hypocrites. And so he goes on to tell us that we need to practice without hypocrisy. He tells us that we need to learn how to give without being hypocrites. We need to learn how to pray and not just be praying because we want somebody to hear how good we can pray. He's telling us that we need to get to a place that when we're fasting, we're not wanting everybody to know that we're just making that sacrifice before God. And then it comes to our text. Jesus is telling his disciples and he's telling the multitude that is upon this mount and he's talking to us today. He's telling us that we must trust him to the place where we are willing to give up control of our own lives. To the place where we're willing to make his kingdom priority in our lives. The thing he's he talks about in Matthew 6, 19 through 34, they're simply not comfortable because he's talking about things that we need to give up. And when we have to give up things, that's never an easy thing. But when the thing that we have to give up is control, it makes it that much scarier because we like control. I like control. I want to be in control of the situation. I don't want to leave control up to somebody else. And so he's challenging us and he's asking us to give all of our control to him. 
Now, we have to keep it in mind that the reason why he's going through all of those subjects is because of the purpose which was found in Matthew 5 and 48. Be ye perfect. We have to be perfect. He's given us the goals that we have to reach. And so we have to strive for those roles and those goals. And then we have to make sure that we're trusting him with everything that we have. We have to give God total control. So tonight, we want to look at this passage, and I believe there are three areas that God is looking for us to relinquish our control and give it all to him. He wants total control over our passions. He wants total control over our finances. And then he wants total control over our destiny. So we're going to look at these three things tonight. Firstly, God wants total control over your passion. If we go to our text in verse 19, Jesus tells us not to lay up treasures on earth. But then he tells us where we need to lay up our treasures. He tells us that we need to lay up our treasure in heaven. And then verse 21, summarizing, he tells us that wherever you lay up your treasures, that's where your heart, that's where your emotions, that's where your passion is going to lie. So the thing that we need to ask ourselves is, what is the treasures? What are the treasures? We have to lay them up in heaven. And so I submit to you tonight for your consideration that the treasures that he's wanting us to lay up is our commitment to the kingdom. Our level of commitment. This is the treasure that he's looking for. It's where we spend our time. It's where we spend our money. It's where we spend our thought life. It's where we spend our outreach efforts. Well, what are you talking about, Brother Dedrick? Well, the things that we are willing to commit to, those are the things that we're going to become passionate about. At different junctures in my life, I've given myself totally to some things. Like the time I gave myself to paintballing. Yes, paintballing. Brother in church say, man, I want you to come paintballing with me. I'm like, I don't know how to paintball. And then he said I needed a gun, a paintball gun. How much is that going to cost me? Well, you could get this cheap one for $15. For real, I got to spend $15 on the gun. He didn't tell me that the gun needed a CO2 tank that I was going to have to buy too. And then when I went and bought the CO2 tank, he didn't tell me that the CO2 don't come in it. You have to pay for that too. So I wasn't too happy about this game. But I went and bought it. Then he says that, oh, we play this game out in the hot sun in the woods. Now, most of you know me. And you know how I feel about heat. So right there, that was something that I felt like I just messed up. But I... On a Saturday, after working hard all week, I went out in the woods in the hot sun with a paintball gun that I didn't spend all this money for. And after that, I became passionate about paintballing. I'm going to tell you, I had fun. As big as I am, I'm hiding in bushes. I'm waiting for people to come by. Bow! I'm telling you, I was hurting people. Then I realized I was good at it. I was like, oh, man. And then I realized my gun is just not going to do what everybody else have. They have the real ones. So then I started going online every day. I'm trying to figure out what type of gun I should get. I'm looking at it all the time. I'm talking about it all the time. And then I went and spent more money on a different gun. Well, now I'm an expert just that quick. And guess what? Everybody else realized it too. So they started following me and they started buying better guns. So then I said, you know what? I got to find a gun that's better than that gun. 
So I went and bought a better gun. Looked like an M16. I'm in fatigues. I got makeup on my face. I'm in the woods shooting people, and I'm having a ball. It's all I could think about. I see people in the store, and I start talking about paintballing. Man, you want to come paintballing? We're going to get a game. And guess what? I got so good, I had such a good weapon that nobody wanted to play with me anymore. And they all quit. And so although I was passionate, <laughs> I didn't have anywhere to play. It let me down. But my passion didn't come from the beginning. It wasn't just something I got passionate about and then I started doing it. I had to do it first and then I became passionate about it. And so God is asking us to give him our time, give him our thoughts, give him our money, and then you'll see where your passion is going to be. You'll see that now you really care about the kingdom because you gave your time to a Bible study. Now you really care about seeing people saved because you put money into this building project, now you want to be here. Now, because this is all you think about, you can't wait till they have some type of class so you can learn more about the word of God. But you got to give yourself to it, totally. He's looking for us to give ourselves to him, totally. I think that a lot of times that we put so much value on money that when we read this passage, we think that he's only talking about money. And so we would preach it as, if you put your money in heaven, that's where your heart is going to be also. But I don't really think that it's just about money because he said that the silver was his, the gold is his. He said he had a cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. You even belong to him. So it can't be about the money. But he wants your time. He wants your thoughts to be on him continually. That's why he said, pray without ceasing. Most of us think praying without ceasing is a challenge. But I know a lot of you can Facebook without ceasing. In the morning when you wake up, when you at these people's job and not on your lunch break and not on your rakes, I'm telling you, when you are actually working at your desk, Facebook without ceasing, at night, midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, Facebooking without ceasing. But when it comes to prayer without ceasing, that don't really make sense to you. Well, give yourself to it. Try it out and then see how passionate you can become about it. Because somebody had to tell you about Facebook before you tried it out. Try praying in the morning. Try going out on your lunch breaks and pray. Just try praying at your desk. Try every time you get the urge to go on Facebook, just say a prayer. And then see how quick Facebook go away and see how quickly you get involved in things that are spiritual. He's looking for your passion. He wants you to become more passionate about his kingdom than you are about yours. And so he's telling us that we have to relinquish the control to him. When there's something that's going on, you need to get involved. When there's a Bible study going on, you don't have nothing else to do, go to it. You say, I teach Bible studies. I don't care. Go to a Bible study. Be a part of it. You might be able to help somebody else. You may be able to give input. He's wanting us to be passionate about the kingdom. God wants us to trust him and know where our fulfillment is, where our joy is, where our happiness is. He wants us to stop trying to find joy, happiness, and other things. Because that's what we're doing. We're trying to find joy. What is going to make me feel good with our control, 
We try to find happiness and joy and fulfillment in the opposite sex, in entertainment, in things like technology, iPads, Samsung Galaxies, whatever it is, cars, clothing. These are the things that we try to find happiness and joy in. But he knows that that happiness and that joy is fleeting, just like my paintballing. I was so happy and passionate about it. It was the greatest thing ever, but it came to an end. Everything in this world that you're going to find happiness in is only going to be there for a moment, and then it's going to be fleeting. But the kingdom of God is going to last forever. So if your passion is in the kingdom of God, that's a feeling you will never lose. The things of this world is going to let you down. Yeah, you might have some fun for the moment, but at some point, it's going to bring you some hardship. Because what was I doing sitting with all these guns, all these paintballs? Now I'm starting to calculate how much money I spent. And guess what I realized? I was dumb. I went to an Army-Navy store. I bought fatigues. I got all this stuff sitting here, and I don't have nowhere to play. I realized I was dumb. There is no real joy in this world. There is no real happiness in this world. But if you can find happiness in the kingdom, it's something that's going to last eternal. Something that's going to be there forever. Secondly, God wants total control over our finances. Matthew 6, 24. Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? So what Jesus is telling us here is every single one of us is going to have to make a choice. And there's really only two options, God or money. He's saying that you are either going to have God as your master or you're going to have money as your master. The word master here in the Greek is kyrios, which means supreme in authority or a controller. A controller. The interesting thing is that most people believe that they have control over money. Think about it. Most people think that they're in control of the money. But Jesus said that money is your master if he's not. That's something that we need to think about. Because it's money that makes you get out of bed and go to that person's job. When Jesus is not going to make you get out of bed and come to church, he's just going to let you choose what you want to do. But money is going to make you do it. Sometimes we tell you, oh, it's the job that's your God. It's not the job because if those people wasn't paying you, you wasn't going. Nobody's like, oh, I'm going to my job and they stop paying me. But I love it. I'm going to keep going back. That's not going to happen. So it's not the job that your God, is your God. It's the money that's mastering you and controlling you and making you get up when you want to sleep. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm not. Money has made many men and women sell themselves just so they can spend 20 minutes with it because guess what money don't stay around either money comes but it has one goal to leave trust me it's gonna be a lot of you gonna get some income tax checks but i guarantee you this time next year you're gonna be looking for another one because that one is gone long gone okay I'm just telling you, money will control you. 
Money will make you do things you never thought you would do. And Jesus is asking you to give him control over your finances. Now, money is trying to tell you that you need it more than you need Jesus. Money is telling you that when your bills was due, you wasn't looking for Jesus, you was looking for me. Yeah, when you knew that those people was going to come turn off your lights, you wasn't looking for Jesus. You was looking for me. And it was me that got your lights turned back on. Now, where was Jesus? Well, that's what money is telling you. But I'll tell you where Jesus was. Jesus was busy taking care of the people that gave him total control over their finances. But since you wanted to handle your finances yourself, Jesus let you do it. And that's why your lights got turned off. That's why your car got repossessed. Because you were in control. And he's just telling you that, look, although money is your master, he's not a good one. He's going to leave you with some tears. He's going to leave you with some pain. When I'm trying to give you joy, when I'm trying to give you happiness, when I'm just trying to love you. You don't think that's the case? Well, I'm going to tell you, I've heard people with a testimony that I gave my last. I gave everything that I had. And I'm telling you, the Lord worked it out. The Lord worked it out. I'm telling you, they asked for that offering, and I know I didn't have the money to give, but I gave it, and the Lord worked it out. Pastor Davey stood up here and asked for $1,500. The brother said, I just said, okay, I'm going to give it. And he said the next day, $1,500 was in the mail. I got a check for $1,500. Why? Because he's giving God control. He's saying, look, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I know I have bills. I know I have things that I need and things that I desire, but you need this. And so I'm going to take care of your house first. This is what God is expecting. He's expecting us to give him control. Come on, the prophet walks up in the house and he asks a lady, he says, look, I want you to bake me a cake. She says, I can't, I'm dying. And I got my child that's about to die too. We're about to bake this cake and we're going to eat it and we're going to die. And he said, no, bake it and give it to me. What? And she did it. Would you? I don't know. I don't know. But she did it. And because she did it, God took care of her. Jesus in Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, Jesus is standing at the offering plate. And he's looking in. And he's watching everybody that's coming by. And the big spenders come, and they drop their money in. And there was one little old lady who came. The Bible says she has two mites. And she dropped it in, and God said, you know what? I have a teaching point right here. So he goes to the disciples, and he says, look, out of all of these people that gave, he said, that little old lady, she gave the most. And they're like, well, she only gave two mice. Isn't that's not the truth? And he said, look, the reason why she gave the most is because they had a lot of money. And so what they did was they look at their income tax check, and they say, well, man, I got $6,000. I'm going to give seventy. dollars Yeah, I'm going to give $70 now. And they threw it in, and she came in, and she had $2, but it was her last $2. And she had bills that needed to be paid. And she, had, she could have stopped by Publix on the way home and got a pack of Rami noodles to eat. But she didn't do that. She put it in the offering. 
And Jesus said she gave more than everybody. Now, the puzzling part to me is the response. Look at what the people have to say. In verse 5, the Bible says, And some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. What? He's still telling them about who gave the most, and then they're talking about the temple. Does that make any sense? Well, if we look at Mark 13 and 1, he tells us that it was one of the disciples who was actually speaking up in this group of people. He was the one that was telling them, talking about this temple and all the things that it had. What do you think that this person, and I, I have an idea of who it could have been out of the 12. <laughs> the one is always taking money and always concerned about money. Yeah, that brother. But he's sitting up there and he's talking about the temple. What do you think that he was really saying to Jesus? He was saying, I hear what you're saying. He said, but if it wasn't for all those big spenders, the AC wouldn't be on up in here making people cold. And they wouldn't have padded pews to sit down on. It was the big spenders' money that did this. Two mice wasn't going to do anything. That's what he was really telling Jesus. But then look at Jesus' reply. In verse 6, he says, For these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which where there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Come on, think about it. What he's telling them. He's saying, yes, the dollars that you gave out of your abundance, it did do some good in this building. You're right, we were able to put up that education wing because you put some money in the offering. He says, but what you don't understand is that one day I'm going to come back and gather my church. What you don't understand is one day this building is going to fall flat. As beautiful as it is, it's not going to be here anymore. And the only thing that's going to be standing is the sacrifices that people made. When the building fall, that lady's sacrifice was still standing, and God was able to see her sacrifice in the midst of all the rubble. The people who are making sacrifices in this place, when this building is gone, and they have to stand before God, and he's going to judge them, their sacrifice is going to stand as a memorial right next to them. But you who thought that, oh, I'm just going to give a few dollars here and there out of my abundance, your memorial is going to be really small, and you're going to wish you had done more. You're going to wish that you had said, man, you know what? I could sacrifice and give that. Well, you may not feel that way, but I'm, I'm thinking in that day you will. In that day when you're standing before God and he's saying, now, you say you couldn't give $1,500, but you had a perfectly good iPhone 4S, and you spent $700 to get a 5S. Wow. And then you spent all this money on movies that you weren't even supposed to be watching. You spend all this money on clothes that you donated to the Goodwill with the tags on them. Well, that's what he's going to say because that's what really happens. Oh, Lord, you know I need this money. I got bills. I can't get that $1,500, but then you're going to find a way to spend it on some things that's frivolous. You're going to find a way to get what you really want. See, I can't drive a Corolla because I need to get that Bugatti. So I'm going to have to stack up my paper to get the Bugatti instead of driving the Corolla, and you're going to find a way to get it. But you're going to tell God that you didn't have the money. And then the kids are still walking across or having to stay in because it's raining, and you feel pretty good about yourself. 
because I did give a few dollars. Well, I'm here to tell you that God wants more than that. He wants it all. He wants it all. And if you would just give it, if you would give him all, he'll take care of you. That's the thing. The thing you are scared of, if I give him all, I'm not going to have anything. That's the lie that the devil's telling you. That's the lie that Satan wants you to believe. Because he knows if you will give God everything, God will take care of you. You will have an abundance. Your refrigerator will never go without. You'll never have to wonder how you're going to pay your bills. If you give God everything, you give him total control over your finances, I guarantee you that God will take care of you like you can never take care of yourself. But if you keep trying to take care of yourself, well, you'll keep going through what you've been going through. And that's your fault. And the last thing that God wants total control over is your destiny. Mark 6, beginning in verse 31, Jesus said, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He already knows it. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Of Destiny. Destiny is defined as the events that will necessarily happen to a particular person or thing in the future. And so we're talking about things that will come. Now, us being in control of our future. That just seems like a pretty logical or a pretty good thing to do. It seems like wisdom. We're preparing for the future. We're storing up for the future. Doesn't that just sound like it just makes good sense? That yeah, I mean, I know that one day my kids are gonna have to go to college, and so I need to store up. One day I'm gonna retire and I'm not gonna have a job and so I need to store up. Makes pretty good sense, right? Well, you may not say anything because you know when it's coming. But the problem with that type of thinking is this. It's at odds with the word of God. Because God is wanting control of tomorrow. He doesn't want you planning out your tomorrow. He wants to do it for you. He just wants you to trust him that he will. Jesus tells this rich young ruler, he says, look, I want you to sell everything you have. Right? Go and give it all to the poor. And then I want you to come and follow me. Now, I'm imagining that if he's a rich young ruler, and he must have a house. He probably got a camel on some 20s. I mean, he has to have a few cows or something. He's calling them rich. I mean, most rich men, you know, they don't have no problem getting women. So he probably has a wife and some kids because he can take care of them all, you know. And Jesus is telling him to go sell everything you have. Now, the normal human being is going to be like, man, if I sell everything I have, then what am I going to be left with? That don't make sense. And when we're reading the story, if you're honest, you probably say the same thing. I mean, God, I mean, Jesus is just being a bit tough on this guy. Yeah, it's extreme. <laughs> but you got to think about it. He's Standing and asking Jesus this question, and there's 12 guys around Jesus who had left everything to follow after him. 
they just gave up everything and followed after Jesus. And so this man comes and Jesus tells him, well, then you need to do what they did. Well, that's what he was saying. If you look at Luke 18, 27, it says, then Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time. That's what most of us are scared about. We believe we're going to go to heaven one day, he says, and in the world to, to come everlasting life. The problem is we think if we give everything away, if we leave it all, that some kind of way we're going to lose it all. And he's telling you, you'll get manifold more than you gave away if you'll just give it away. I.e., give and it shall be given. Good measure. Press down, shaking together, running over. You're just giving. He didn't ask you to give Good measure, press down. He just said give. Right? Okay. So here, he's standing in front of the disciples, and he's asking this question, and Jesus just simply said, do what they did, and you'll get what they're going to get. But you know what? He couldn't do it. He walked away sorrowfully. Some people just can't believe that God wants everything. They just don't believe that God wants to be in control of tomorrow. But he really does. If we look at Luke 12, Jesus is telling a parable. In the beginning in verse 16, it says, saying, the, he says, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, okay, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I stow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall thy things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, look at the story. He gets all of this abundance, right? And his tragic mistake was he didn't think about people. He could only think about himself and his future. And God is saying, look, first of all, you don't even know if you have a future because I hold that. And so if I give you an abundance, what would make you think it's for you? Why couldn't you go and say, well, I have so much that I'm going to find somebody who needs something and I'm going to give it to them and so we can all have. And then I'm just going to trust God that next harvest is going to be more. But that's not what he thought about. He thought about his tomorrow. Mine. What am I? I can, I can put all this big, build bigger barns and then I'm going to be able to sit back and say, I'm good. Forget everybody else. I got my stash. If they, didn't, if they didn't make, man, look, they need to go and work and make their own. I made this. I did this. I, I, I sound like a certain angel who's no longer an angel. And he's saying, no, 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 no. You can't do that. You can't just get all of these goods from me because I'm the one that allowed you to get it and then think that you're going to hoard it for yourself because that's not what I gave it to you for. I gave it to you because there's people around who need you. Because guess what? If you have a need and you get on your knees and you pray, I'm almost certain that when you get that need, some kind of way is going to be connected to a human. 
I mean, because there's been times that we've prayed and asked God, and it was a person, whether it's sinner or saint, that sent us something. It was a person. I don't know about how many of y'all angels come and give y'all what y'all pray for, but an angel never came to me and gave me nothing. It was people. So when I have something, even though if in my mind I don't think it's that much and I see somebody else in need, if I'm hoarding it, what did he say? He says, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself. It is not rich towards God. What is going to make me rich towards God? Striving for that goal. Striving for perfection. Striving to be everything that he's called me to be. Striving to trust him the way that he's asked me to trust him. Trust him with my passion. Trust him with my money. Trust him with my tomorrow. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know. But I know that if I trust you, Lord, you're going to take care of everything. Does it seem scary? Yes, it does. But guess what? When you really trust God, when you really know that God is not a liar, because to me, I'm just talking about myself. I'm not going to talk about y'all because I don't want nobody to try to beat me down, even though I don't think you can. But I'm just talking about me. When I'm telling God, well, you know what, you said you was going to do this, but I'm not really sure about it, so I'm going to try to do it myself. I think what I'm really saying to him is that he's a liar. I'm saying to him, God, I know you said in your word that if I give, it shall be given, but I'm going to just try this whole hold on to it thing and see if I can work it out. And what I'm really saying is, I don't think that what you said was true. I don't think if I really give this, you're going to take care of me. And then you're going to pull up some reason from your past, just like I have, to tell him why. Because remember that time when I gave this, that, and the other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was after you got yourself in trouble that you came to me. See, it wasn't beforehand. It was after you made the boo-boo, then you came to me and say, fix it, Jesus. But if you would have just gave it to me from the beginning, you would have never been in that place. I'm just telling you what I see when I read these scriptures. God is telling people, he's called people to ministry. You know it. You know when God has called you to do something. You know when God has told you what he's wanting you to do, and in your mind, no, I'm going to try something else. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to I wanna be a corporate executive. I want to drive nice cars, and I'm looking at them preachers. I mean, they, they struggling. <laughs> they struggling. Uh -uh, that's not what he's called me to. And so you start blocking this stuff out your mind. I'm here to tell you, he wants to be in control of your tomorrow. He wants to be in control of your destiny. He don't want you to rely on yourself. Because guess what? Working for a Fortune 500 company, becoming an executive there, that's not going to secure your future because guess what? In one day, that business can fall. In one day, you can lose everything. In one day, they can you can find out that people been playing with paperwork and now you got to go to prison in one day. But if you follow after the will of God and you sacrifice and you do what God has called you to do, you'll find happiness like you've never known. You'll understand what true joy is. He's wanting to be in control of your tomorrow. He's wanting to be the one that's going to show you the things that you're trying to find. But you have to first give him everything. God wants to be in total control. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to do that God wants to do for us? That's what we've got to figure out. That's what we have to do. We have to look at our lives and say, what is it? that God wants from me that I'm holding back from him. And when you find that thing, 
you need to give it to Jesus. You need to tell him, you know what? I'm not going to keep control of it, Lord. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you my passion. I'm not going to find things in this world to give my passions to. I'm just not going to do it. And yes, Lord, I know it's tight. But I'm not going to complain about building funds. And I'm not going to complain when we need to take up money for anything. But I'm going to try my best to give. I'm going to go and I'm going to look at my finances and I'm going to say, you know what? This is something that you need to understand. God is not looking for an emotional response where somebody gets up here and then they get you all jacked up and then you go and you give the money and then you walk out the door and you're sorrowful. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for people who trust him. And this is what trust is. Trust is when you look at your bills and you say, man, I really could use this for this, that, and the other. And you say to yourself, you know what? Even though I could, I'm not. I'm going to take it and give it to Jesus. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for people who would submit their will to his. Say, you know what, Lord? Not my will, but yours. Whatever it is that you ask me to do. And if you can do that, then you'll be fulfilling Matthew 5 and 40. When he said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. That's what we need to strive for. And the way we do that is by giving him total control. You can stand. Sometimes when you're reading the word of God, you have to deal with those words. And they may not always be pleasant. But it's one thing that I've learned. That if you will do what God asks you to do, your life will be so much better. I have so many horror stories that I can tell you about times when I tried to do things my way and they never worked out. But then I do have those stories of when I submitted my will to his and just did it. And I can tell you, you may look at my life and not understand how I'm happy. You may say, well, man, if I was in his position, there's no way in the world I could have joy. But I'm here to tell you that I can wake up in the morning and know that I'm pleasing him. I can wake up in the morning and know that the things that I'm doing is for him and that he's well pleased. And I promise you, there is no joy like that. We need to just submit to God and give him control. These altars are open if you need a place to pray. If you want to dedicate yourself to God all over again and say, you know what, Lord, I haven't been giving you everything, but today I'm letting you know that from this day forward, I'm going to give you total control. I'm not going to try to keep any of it for myself. Come.